What are some benefits of a healthy and pure conscience? And how can we maintain a pure one? And then when I see somebody else who's dealing with the same stuff that I'm dealing with, I go, man, if he can do it in my life, he can do it in yours too. And it's a positive thing and not, not a negative thing. Does that make sense to anybody? So by avoiding the subject of conscience, psychologists avoid the subject of sin and accountability to God. The church is supposed to see people healed, mended, delivered, and set free so that we can perpetuate healing, mending, and set free. Everybody has an inner sense that God is there and therefore accountable to him. And listen, people that don't want to believe that God exists pay doctors, pharmacists, and everybody else that they can to help them to numb the sense that they have that God does exist. I just got your Bibles. Let me see those. Hold them up. Well done. Electronic Bibles. Well done. Turn to me, please. To Romans chapter 1. Who knows who the little animation is on the screen? Who is that? Jiminy Cricket. How many of you remember watching Pinocchio back in the day? Huh? I loved watching Pinocchio until he went to the uh, amusement park. I wanted to skip through that part. I just, I could, I hated that part. Um, so I'd skip all the bad stuff. You know, and then get to the, get to get where he becomes a, a real boy. But Jimmy the Cricket was a faithful little cricket. Now, I look at him, and I, I have great affection for Jimmy the Cricket. But when I'm out there mowing the grass and I see him jumping through the grass, I kill every last one of them. Um, but in that particular uh, cartoon, Jimmy the Cricket was a, was a tremendous voice and help to Pinocchio. And... It's difficult sometimes to explain conscience to believers and unbelievers alike because at the end of the day, your conscience is going to speak to you about moral and ethical things. And if your moral compass is corrupt, your conscience will be too. So it's important that we have a real understanding of what a conscience is, what it's for, how it functions, and and how we can use it. Um, you know, it might be one thing if you inherited a bunch of tools and stuff uh, from a relative when they passed, but if you don't know how to use the tools you inherited, then what you got is free storage in your garage, right? And so it's important that, that you don't just understand that you have tools that are useful, but that you can apply them. And one of the tools in your garage is a conscience. And if you don't understand how to use that, then it benefits nobody. So maintaining that conscience is essential. And it's essential for a number of things, including intimacy with God, confidence in prayer, effectiveness in ministry. All of these things come out of a clean conscience. You want to know why a lot of marriages have problems? Because somebody has a dirty conscience. You want to know why a lot of people come to church and they're surrounded by people that are hearing from God, being touched by God, being blessed by God, getting words from God, getting healed, mended, restored, set free, and delivered, and they sit there? You want to know why? Because many times they're carrying a very contaminated conscience that does not allow them to believe that it can happen for them. It's a restricted ability that when, when, they, when they are, uh, the pressure of the Holy Spirit is trying, to, is trying to pressure through, it's like a clogged hose. Am I making sense to anybody? And so if you find yourself, listen, I've been going to church for, you know, 15 years, 25 years, 80 years, and I just, I just can't see, my relationship with the Lord just doesn't ever seem to take root. It doesn't grow. It doesn't produce a whole lot of, I just don't understand this. I, I have all the knowledge. I, I have all the, the intellect, and I, it makes sense. It just doesn't work for me. It may be that your conscience is fighting against you. 
You ever tried to you ever tried to clean the carpets or something and and while you're you're vacuuming you're you just about got it done somebody walks in with muddy boots and they they drape through you know and you're like I can't get this place clean because every time I get it clean, somebody, that's how our conscience is with the things of God. So by the time we're saying yes to the Lord, all this floodgate of nonsense comes in. So conscience is incredibly important. So what is a conscience? I'm going to deal with that. What are some of the conditions of conscience referenced in the Bible? What are some benefits of a healthy and pure conscience? And how can we maintain a pure one? How many's ever heard of the self-esteem movement? Nobody? Self-esteem movement. The self-esteem movement has drawn a lot of teachings of secular psychologists. Now, I'm not going to say that nobody's been benefited from psychologists. I've gotten in trouble with a friend of mine that was a professional counselor and, and uh, uh, psychologist of sorts, and... Um, it got a little bent at me because I said, you know, I think many times that's a substitute for the work of the Holy Spirit. If we just listen to God, God would fix us, and instead of tinkering with the head, we tinker with the heart that tells the head what to do. I think we'd, we'd be better off. Um, but the, the secular side, I'm going to say this too. In my personal experience, I have not seen anybody that I know that took psychology courses that came out the better for it. They may have thought they were better for it, but all them that knew them didn't think so. Does that make sense? See, the moment, the moment you get involved in psychology courses, they, they want to classify everybody. Well, these people do this, and these people do that, and you know the, these kind of people do this. and all. So what they wind up doing is they start psychoanalyzing every relationship they got. Oh, well, you're just a narcissist. Oh, well, you're just a control freak. Oh, well, you're just... Th- and they, they try to classify it because that's what they're learning. That's one thing I really love about the Bible because what I'm learning is how to see my own reflection in Scripture go, oh, I need to fix that. No, I need to fix this. And, oh, God needs to do this in my life and tune me up there. And then when I see somebody else who's dealing with the same stuff that I'm dealing with, I go, man, if he can do it in my life, he can do it in yours too. And it's a positive thing and not, not a negative thing. Does that make sense to anybody? And so I, I, I really struggle sometimes with, with the secular field of, of psychology, I, I'm really going to say some stuff, and it might hack some of you off, and it's just okay. This is where I'm at today in my pilgrimage, okay? I really think that psychology and psychologists and psychiatrists, I think it borderlines on witchcraft. I think there's a fine line because they're, they're dealing with the psyche and they're dealing with the manipulation of the mind when my Bible says we need to wash our mind with the water of the Word to get it clean, not trying to organize our piles of junk in the mind. Y'all don't hear anything I'm saying. Okay, moving on. Send your hate mail to I don't give a flying flip at gmail.com. So, self-esteem movement, movement, their concepts, they just don't come from the Bible. And their terminology doesn't come from Scripture. In many ways, their teaching is a substitute for biblical teaching. I want you to hear that again. In many ways, the, the, the teaching of secular psychologists is a substitute for biblical teaching. Because biblical teaching teaches us to be self-aware. <laughs> know your enemy. Know what you're thinking. Control your thoughts. We're supposed to allow the Holy Spirit to make changes in us instead of us justifying our position in being this way by blaming our family. How many times have you heard me say, listen, if you're an adult, then it doesn't matter what your childhood was like. You're grown. And you know that what happened to you wasn't right. So you acting a fool now is no justification because you know what happened to you was wrong. If you know what happened to you was wrong, get healed, get set free, get delivered, and live the life you know you can have. So by avoiding the subject of conscience, psychologists avoid the subject of sin and accountability to God. I don't want to talk about that. Listen, 
It's not sin, Joshua. It's not sin. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You go into class, you're kicking people, tripping people, slapping people, pouring pop on people, dumping coffee on, on reports, and you go to a psychologist, he says, what are you doing all this stuff for? Well, I just, you know, I've just had it rough, and, you know, I got messed up when I was a kid. Oh, it's, it's not your fault. No, if you're in the class kicking people, tripping people, jumping, you know, Dr. Pepper and coffee on the, it is your, that's, that's wrong. It's sinful. And so what we do is we have sin avoidance syndrome. I just coined that. You like that? It's sin avoidance syndrome. Sass. And somehow we're being taught that if you don't believe it's a sin, it's no longer a sin. And if you ignore it as a sin, it won't have an impact on you. Can I just tell you why they like to teach that? Because they know it won't go away, and it's going to get bigger and make babies, and you're going to keep coming back to them. So once they got a customer, they got a perpetual. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. They got to pray. You want to know, you want to know why? <laughs> the church is supposed to see people healed, mended, delivered, and set free so that we can perpetuate healing, mending, and set free. Why do you suppose all these people that come out and say, listen, I found that this herb cures X, Y, Z? A week later, they're dead. You read them in the obituary. Why? Because there's a system at play that is, that, is, that is greedy and wants income from your addiction to their solution that's not a solution. They would rather you keep your problem and be addicted to them than be addicted to Jesus and lose the problem. Here's another thing. If any of these secular psychologists were to ever admit that somebody was better or healed or restored by church, the gospel, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, you know, any of that stuff, they would necessarily put themselves out of business because everybody would want what they say did what they couldn't do. You see what I'm saying? So... Listen, I'm not trying to pour gasoline on your fire if you've been going to psychologists. I'm just telling you, they're, they're not trained from the Bible. So they want to teach you that guilt is not even an emotion that you should have. Guilt really is just feelings. There's nothing substantive to it. But the Bible tells us that guilt is the result of violating God's commandments. That is a built-in warning light on your spiritual dashboard that when you sin, that thing starts warning, 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 warning. Why? Because it doesn't want you to get comfortable, continue to do that because it will cause irreparable harm and damage. When some of you get that little idiot light on your dashboard that says, check your oil, <laughs> You need to check it real quick and not just say, oh, that's been on for three months now. You know what I'm saying? Now, listen, because the results happen a little faster when your idiot like that says need fuel and need fuel now, you, you've learned to pay attention to that one. Why? Because you know if you run out of gas, the engine don't run. But some of you have never replaced an engine. Some of you don't even know what it is to go to a quick stop or a Jiffy Lube or, a, or any kind of an oil change. Oil change? What do you do oil change for, man? Oil's been good ever since I bought the car back in 1969. You know, so we, we, we have this mentality that if it still runs, then the light must be lying. Oh, God, help me right now. So we think that if we're still living, then, then what I'm doing must not be wrong because I'm, I'm still running. And we don't realize that we're running on half the cylinders. Because we've already scorched half of them, and the other ones have got the herky jerks, you know what I'm saying? Nothing's running right. You can't idle anything. You, you get jelly in the brain just from sitting in an idle at a red light. It's ridiculous. There's no efficiency. There's no towing capacity. There's nothing there, but you think that just because I'm still living, I'm still breathing, that everything's okay, and it's not. So 
somehow I think those little herky jerks I did is going to make it into one of our shorts. I don't know why, but I think it is. So they like to avoid the subject of conscience. Because if you start talking about conscience, now you've got to talk about sin. And now you've got to talk about accountability to God. And now you've got to talk about guilt. And now you've got to talk about all this stuff that they, don't, they want to avoid that stuff. So they want to pass off all of that as, that's just feelings. Don't worry about it. You, you can change what you think. You can change what you believe about that, and it won't have the effect. That is a counterfeit gospel. Let me just say it like I really want to say it. It's witchcraft. It's a lie. It's casting dispersions on the truth. There really is safety in sticking with biblical terms. Words carry concepts. I don't know how many of these clips that you've been watching, even in our government, where a congressman will ask an expert, can a man have a baby? And when they start the response by, Mr. Congressman, I know exactly where they're going. They will try to tell you that a man can have a child. Two and three-year-olds can tell you the difference anatomically, structurally, skeletally, what the difference between a man and a woman is. And yet we're working so hard to try to make, oh, Mr. Mr. Man, you want to have a baby? Well, you just go right on ahead, dude, so you can have that baby. We'll tell people anything they want to hear to make them feel good about themselves, knowing that it can't last. You catch what I'm saying? Why do you think the Bible says in the last days people will have itching ears and they will, they will listen to foreign gospels and things that are not from God? Why? Because they want people to tell them that the nonsense that they want to believe is right. But when you stand before God, the ruler is the ruler. I think it's amazing. In uh, in the animal kingdom, we have not one example of a male producing or birthing, I should say, offspring. But a few years ago, somebody said, "Well, I think there's more than two genders." <gasps> And now it is almost law, almost law, that you can't say that a man can't birth. I, I mean, I, I struggle with that. It, it, this is not meant to be political. I, I don't even have this part of my notes. It just makes, it, it makes the point that we're working so hard to convince people of nonsense for the express purpose of avoiding the truth. Words matter. Words matter. Language does evolve, and there are subjects that, that Scripture doesn't specify, but we need to be very cautious with terms that are not in Scripture. I'm not saying you can't use terms that are not in Scripture. I'm saying you need to be cautious with the ones that you do. Because if you're not careful, you'll start expressing things that are unscriptural concepts, not just unscriptural words. So, self-awareness is definitely a biblical reality. There's, there's, there's no denying that. Um, we have an inner sense of moral accountability. Moral Accountability. Everybody has an inner sense that God is there and therefore accountable to him. And listen, people that don't want to believe that God exists pay doctors, pharmacists, and everybody else that they can to help them to numb the sense that they have that God does exist.
if the deck was ever stacked against the church, it is stacked against the church in 2024. But here's the hope I have. God knew in 2024 that the deck would be stacked against the church. Y'all need to hear this. I feel this right here in my belly when I'm about to say this. I need, I need you to hear this. So God created the dream team. Yes, He did. He created the dream team to be alive in 2024 because he knew that if he compiled the right team together that would listen to him and trust him and obey him and pray to him and listen to him and do what he said do when he said do it, we'd have victory all the time. And so what's happened is the dream team doesn't yet know that they're the dream team. Because they've still been hanging out in the locker room and on the bench watching us get the, 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 the game just mopping the floor with us. And they begin to wonder, God, are you really on our side? And God is saying, listen, not only am I on your side, I've empowered you to be a power player. I need you to get off the bench and in the game. I, I called you for this time. I built you for this time. I've anointed you in such a way. You've got a David anointing on you for the season of Goliath that we're in. You're built for this. But society has told you you're weak, you're stupid, you believe nonsense, you believe myths. And if you're not careful, you believe the nonsense and you'll live far below your potential. Listen, I've been driving a a Honda Ridgeline for the last couple of years, and I, I love that vehicle. It's, it's been a great, great truck. But I've read some stuff on them. On a normal day, you can run ethanol just fine. But if you go and pull something, get 100% gas. <laughs> the church started giving way a little bit. Well, we don't have to hold that line quite so hard on that because we, we might run some people off. So how about we just put 10% ethanol in the gospel? Just 10%. Just 10%. Still 90% power, but just 10% because we, we want to bring more people in. And then over the time, people that believed in the 10% said, Hey, if the 10% is right, why not have more of it? Let's go 25%. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Until finally the gospel is so diluted that there's no power in the house. So when, when, when somebody brings 100% gas, 100% fuel, 100% anointing, it hacks off most of the people in the church because they say, I'm not built for that because my internal components are designed to handle the corrosive stuff we call ethanol in the gospel. We were never called to digest that. That's why when you hear certain, certain gospels or ministers or ministries saying stuff that is pleasing to the ear, it gives you indigestion in your spirit because your spirit knows better. Your flesh is saying, yeah, give me that. And at the same time, your spirit's vomiting. So I've learned you cannot please the flesh and the spirit simultaneously most of the time. So that's why, that's why you have to crucify the flesh so the spirit can get what it needs. Because the flesh will not stop getting in the way of what God is trying to give to your spirit. So you've got to kill that thing every day. Oh, you trying to get up? Oh, no, you ain't. No, no. Crucify that thing. But if you're not careful, you start hanging around. Oh. That movie ain't that bad. Come on, man. Come on, man. I mean, you know it ain't that bad. I ain't all that. Come on now. 10%. In fact, this is only 5% ethanol. Come on. See, we don't like it when I say it like this because we see a bigger picture. But you don't always see the bigger picture when somebody's inviting you to go back to that bar, to go back to that site, go back to that restaurant, go back to that part of town, go back to that. 
oh, well, I'm a different person now. I can go back over there now. If you're different, why are you going back where you were when you wasn't different? If you're different now, go to places that are different. You catch what I'm saying? All right, let me throw some Bible at you. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Y'all need to write in your Bible. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ethanol and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Now, here's a verse that all of you should know. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Even the order of the world declares the Creator. Our construction declares the Creator. Our very existence inflames the enemy because even when we're not living right, we still look like our Creator. It's amazing to me, people in the church working so hard to devoid themselves of the heritage of God that should be producing fruit in their life. Let me just be really transparent. I remember when I was in my younger days, and I, I'm, I'm believing God that my kids have and are skipping the rebellious nonsense that I chose to go through. Watch this. Because I see the rebellion, the hate, the anger, the resentment, the rage, the murder, the violence, the, 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 the demeaning and the demonization in other people. And the reason I'm able to identify it in other people is because I used to be friends with the ones that's using them. Let me put it another way. I know they're demonic dealer. I do. I know they're demonic dealer. That's why in deliverance, when the enemy sees me and I see the enemy, many times you hear me say, oh, it's you. Because I recognize them and they recognize me. They go, oh, it's you. you. You catch what I'm saying? And when I see that functioning in people that I know and love, it breaks my heart because I know in order for them to get out of the hole they're in, I know the process it takes to get out. And the problem with being in the pit is you have a pit mentality. Jesus, help me right now. You have a pit mentality. So you think everything's slimy, nothing's clean, nobody's there to help you, everybody's there to pull you back down. And so you have this mistrust and this distrust and this anger and the, all this stuff that's going on because you're in the pit. So when somebody's on the outside either reaching a hand in or dropping a rope, there's mistrust there. How dare you reach out a hand as though that I'm beneath you. Hey, stupid, you are. You want out or you don't. But we're being taught you can't offend people like that. Really? You think Jesus is going to care about offending people when they stand before him? And he says, let me, let me break it down for you. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but you're not in. <laughs> Jesus is not going to be worried about your feelings when you're standing before him. So why would I worry about your feelings? Now, listen, that's why I preach different. I teach different. I pastor different. I function different than most that I know because I don't give a flying flip what you think about me because that has no bearing on what I'm called to do. I can't even be effective at what I do if I care one iota what you think of me. So glare at me. Grit your teeth. Growl. Hiss. Do whatever you got to do because I'm going to go home and go to bed and I'm going to sleep. I 
I'm not saying that to be inflammatory. I'm saying that because we, we, have, we have been so concerned with not offending people that we've offended God in the process. Somebody's got to get offended. Because the truth is going to divide. Somebody just posted it. Two or three of you, I think, posted it. Said, said a lot of pastors won't actually preach the truth because they're going to preach the truth. Most people would leave. Churches are not conditioned for the truth. That's real fuel. They're conditioned for ethanol. Here's the reason why ethanol is cheaper. <laughs> ah, Romans one thirty two. Romans one thirty two. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Let me put it this way. People that are willingly and knowingly in sin will willingly and knowingly approve of others that are in sin to not bring any undue attention to them. Birds of a feather. Why is the house of God full of crows instead of eagles? Why is the house of God full of vultures? They don't want to kill their own food. They want it supplied. They're willing to eat somebody else's leftovers because at least they didn't have to kill them. They would rather scavenge and have just enough to live rather than fly high. I, here's my hope. I hope to ruin you so bad. I hope to ruin you so bad that when somebody tries to give you a little ethanol, it makes you mad. I'm serious about that. I want you so ruined, not so that you just crave or want no excuses or crave or want me. I just want you to want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I, 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 want, you, I, want, your little, I want your spiritual nose to go, something about that ain't right. Mm, no, something about that. Mm, that is a foreign smell in my nose. I am, mm, no, that is offensive. I'm not taking that. Smells like Brussels sprouts. I'm out. Hey. I saw a comedian. So who posted it? Who posted the, the, was it you? So, yeah. So I, I saw it. He said, he said, listen, I found this great recipe. You get you a bunch of Brussels sprouts. You put the olive oil on top. There's certain spices. This one you put on, you set the oven at 350. You put it in there for 15 minutes. And as soon as they come out, you throw them right in the trash and order pizza. <laughs> Best recipe for Brussels sprouts. I want to give you five conditions of a conscience. Five conditions of a conscience. How many's ever had a check engine light come on in your vehicle? And if you don't have your own gizmo... Then you run down to AutoZone, O'Reilly's, or whatever, Napa. If you, if you just have more money and you know what to do with you go to the dealer. And they plug this device in this port underneath your dashboard, and the car tells it what's wrong with it. It's self-diagnosis. Okay? So I'm going to give you five codes of a conscience. Five codes. Number one. A pure conscience is one that is free from accusation. So the first code is that of a pure conscience. It's undefiled in that person because it has not violated its standard, or more importantly, the standard of God. In Acts chapter 24, verse 16, Acts 24, verse 16, Paul said that he always strived to what? To have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Listen. 
That means that if you don't maintain a pure conscience, it'll start running lean or start running rich, and it'll get out of whack. If it runs rich, you get a little bold and you get, you get upset at God. If you run a little lean, then you wind up being a little short with your, with your friends and loved ones. So you got to make sure that you don't function in offense towards God or other people. Some of you are going to be a little bit of crossroads tonight. Some of you in this room, maybe some of you watching the video. Because your tendency is going to want to be to be offended at me. I just can't believe he said it like that. He's just taking a little bit too much enjoyment and saying it like that. You mean enjoy him telling you the truth? Yes, I do enjoy doing that. Because I want to keep my conscience clean. You want to know the reason I'm able to knock off the sleep so, so easily? Because I'm not up thinking, oh, I should have said it like that. Like, oh, man, I, I said that wrong. Oh, that was wrong. And I don't have that. So you keep it clean. Listen, if you've got clean fuel injectors, keep them clean. Every once in a while, put some good additive there in the fuel. Every now and again, run the real fuel. I think sometimes we come to Jesus, God, I'm so jacked up. Fix me. He says, okay. Pulls the big chest over there. He fixes all up. And then our first thing is go find the junkiest fuel, the most used up, ridiculous oil. Go right back to the very thing that causes me jacked up in the first place. God is not setting us free to go back into the junk that we got set free from. I'll be really honest here. A lot of people come to church for the same reason they go to the doctor. Give me a pill that will remove my symptoms. Don't matter if I'm dying. Don't matter if I'm so diseased that I got six months to live. I just don't want to feel like I got six months to live. So just give me a pill that caused me to avoid the symptoms of my condition. God is not trying to give you a pill to keep your condition. He wants to give you the truth to cut out the disease and change your condition. Most of the church doesn't want that. Cutting it out is painful. Cutting it out causes blood. I faint at the sight of blood. You just don't want to bleed in front of me. We want to do everything we can except what we're supposed to do. And then somehow, in this twisted theology, we think that if we can make that happen, then God's going to fling open the gate and say, come on in, well done that you skirted the system. The feel-good message is Sunday on Mother's Day. He says, I strive to always keep my conscience clear before God and man. That's the key to success that Paul had in his ministry was a pure, clean conscience. The Philip translation says, I do my utmost to live my whole life with a clear conscience before God and man. So here's a question. Are you doing the absolute best that you know how to do to keep your conscience clear of any offense against God or against people? A little ethanol is, as long as you and God are okay, it doesn't matter that you're still hacked off at people. A little ethanol says, as long as you're okay with everybody else, God will just get over it. He's so loving, he'll put up with it. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? A little leaven... <laughs> It affects the whole lump. How many's ever went and bought fuel injection cleaner? 
comes a little bitty bottle about that big. And if you read on it, it says, it will treat up to 25 gallons. Going to treat 25 gallons. And we believe that nonsense. Come on. But I tell you, a little sin, it will jack up your whole system. Trying to allow sin in your life is having a gasoline engine and trying to put just a little bit of diesel in to get you down the road. You know, there's a reason why they put unleaded fuel and diesel nozzles that size because people will try it. People are still trying it in the church. 2 Timothy 1, verse 3. He says he serves God with a pure conscience. I want you to notice he's aware of the condition of his conscience. He's self-aware. It's disturbing to me when I go to pray for somebody and I have to tell them that their conscience is jacked up because they are so not self-aware they have no clue what's wrong with them. First Timothy 3 9. Paul says church leaders must maintain a pure conscience. And the Greek word translated pure is katharos. We get our English word catharsis from it. It means pure, clean, or unsoiled. So why am I taking so much time to, to define what conscience is? How are you going to know how to maintain it if you don't know what it is? How are you going to know how to check the oil if you don't know what a dipstick is? Number two, code of a conscience is a defiled conscience. And that's referenced in Titus 1.15. And there, Paul talks about dishonest gain. He talks about greedy liars. He says, even their mind and conscience are defiled. So that context gives us a little idea of what he means when he says, uh, what can defile the conscience. Dishonest gain, gluttony, lying are all mentioned. The conscience is polluted, it's soiled, it's stained. That is a defiled conscience. You're intentionally running on things that you know you're not meant to run on. Number three. An evil conscience. An evil conscience. It's the opposite of a good conscience. Hebrews 10.22 tells us to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. This kind of conscience has got to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Anton LaVey, in my estimation, had an evil conscience. He had given himself completely and wholly over to a conscience that was absolutely polar opposite against God. I think he bought into his own narcissism. I think he bought into his own lies. And unfortunately, there's so many people, a lot of them who think there's hundreds and thousands of genders, are going to have the same response that Anton did as he exited from this life and entered into the next one when he said, what have I done? What have I done? It's not supposed to be this way. I don't know about you, but that is not on my hit list of things that I want to be my last words. I'm going to say it like this. Evil does not always present itself as being anti-God or anti-gospel. Evil is so slick 
that you think you're getting the real thing when you're not. When the God of the universe, the creator of all that's known, tells you, eat any tree you want, just not that one. I don't think there's any confusion there. And yet the serpent said, are you sure he said this one? You sure it wasn't that one? They're so close together. They look so much alike. They're, they're both the apple trees. I mean, this one, really? I don't think God put a sign there. Do not eat this bad tree. He just said, that one, don't touch it. I, I think this is just me, okay? I'm, I'm imagining. I think some days when Eve got a little upset at Adam, she'd stroll by the tree and just look at it. I'm going to tell you, because proximity to it, when nothing bad happens, when you're close. I don't think it's all that bad, Adam. And the enemy sees this. Let me put this in perspective. Some of y'all scrolling, seeing sites and, 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 and seeing books and magazines and seeing people that you used to hang with and, and, and smelling the smells of the stuff you used to ingest. And, and you're thinking, I can handle it. Look, <laughs> I can handle that. Pfft. Ain't nothing. Until one day, we're so accustomed to being around it, it's such a small step now to partake of it. Whereas before, if we had kept a, a clean and pure conscience and stayed away from it, that'd be a long way to have to get over there. But we keep trying to press it. You see what I'm saying? That's why purity puts a lot of real estate. I don't even want to be able to see what it is over there. I want to be so far over here, I don't even know where that tree's at. You catch what I'm saying? Let me ask this. When Jesus comes back, do you want to be this far from that tree or do you want to be found this far from that tree? Number four, the worst condition is code four. It's a conscience that's seared. Now, I'm going to say this, and it might inflame a few of you. You might have a seared conscience, or you might know somebody that does. This is a condition of apostates that rejected the truth and led others into their error. I want to say some really inflammatory stuff. I know that there's a lot of churches that do small groups. And they try to encourage everybody to get in a small group. Everybody. The problem with small groups is every small group's got to have a leader. And not every leader that they put in small groups is called to lead anything, much less a small group. You catch anything I'm saying? So what winds up happening is you get somebody who's leading five who envisions themselves leading 5,000, and they think that any thought that comes into their head is a God thought, and they start reading stuff into Scripture that the Scripture plainly does not say. And because other people that are in that small group realize that the church put that person in as a leader of the small group, they have some trust in them that they wouldn't ordinarily have. So they start, they start receiving this ethanol. You catch what I'm saying? And before long, you have offshoots that are coming out that, that, that defy the root system of the house they say they came from. Am I saying that all churches that have small groups have? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the danger is there. Guys, we, we're so ridiculously close. Why in the world I'm going to play with a new system and start hanging badges on people to lead that might have bluffed me but can't bluff God and have just enough ethanol in them that they release something to their small group that takes them down a path that leads them to hell? And guess who that leads back to? Me. Why? Because I instituted that. Does that make sense? 
That's why it's very important. That, that's why I'm very, I'm very cautious who fills the pulpit. So cautious, in fact, I feel it most of the time. Not because I think I'm all that. I just feel like if I'm going to be held responsible for what's said, I might as well be the one saying it. You catch what I'm saying? A seared conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit, capital S, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. That's scary. That's scary. Who in their right mind, who's ever been on the ark of God's goodness and grace, would ever feel compelled to jump off into troubled waters and depart from the safety of the ark? What would it take to make somebody want to jump from the safety of God's ark? And yet the scripture says, in the last days, some will. Let's pretend for a minute that this is a boat that God has instituted, and we're floating on the ocean. Okay? And Mary gets a little close to the edge and she's looking off the edge and she's watching the waves and she's getting a little hypnotized by the waves and you can tell she's thinking stuff she, she ought not be thinking. She's considering just jumping off this ship. Maybe it's because n none of us talk to her. Maybe it's because none of us have a relationship with her. Maybe it's because we said something that offended her. I don't know. But for whatever reason, she's over there thinking about jumping. How do we keep people from jumping? If y'all playing telephone through the crowd to get word to me to go get her, you've missed the point. If you see that she's thinking about jumping, you ought to be motivated to jump into action and say, hey, what's up, Mary? How you doing? What you doing? What you doing over here? Why don't you come over here? Let's go eat over here. You see what I'm saying? Go get her. Why are you calling? Pastor, I think you ought to know. I think Mary's getting close to jumping. <laughs> Go get her. Does it make sense? I don't think you're willing to jump, Mary. I don't think anything's wrong. I'm just, okay. But a seared conscience A seared conscience says she knows better and she's okay. And if she feels like she needs to jump, then glory. Seared because I'm not compelled. There's no compassion in me that motivates me to do what's, what's not fun, what's inconvenient, what's bothersome. Love makes you do things you don't want to do. Love makes you go where you, there's sometimes I'll call Rachel and I'm hoping she's going to say no and I say, baby, you need anything on my way home? No, no, baby, I, I'm good. You know, now we do this. Oh, no, oh, man. Right? But if she says we need, we need, you know, dog food, cat food, whatever, milk, guess what I'm doing on the way home? Not what I want to do, but I'm going to do because I love her. Y'all make, making sense? Love will make you do what you don't want to do. You want to know why a lot of people don't even like coming to church? Because they know God's going to deal with them to do what they don't want to do. And they'd rather play the grace card staying at home. Well, God know my heart. Yes, he knows. He knows you're hard. You're running on ethanol. He knows you've got all kinds of deposits in your life that needs to come out. He knows. <laughs> ah. Okay. So the Spirit expressly says, in a latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. And doctrines of demons. Demons. 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. You guys know I like westerns. And when them big bad cowboys got shot, had somebody dig the bullet out, and they're bleeding. So they put the knife in the fire, both sides. They give them a little whiskey. I'm not advocating that. Stick a stick in their mouth. Psst. Why? It sears it and stops the bleeding. Jesus wasn't seared. He was pierced so blood and water would flow. And he expects you and I to flow. And the enemy comes in our life. Psst. You know them people just want from you. That's all they take, 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 take. You know that's all they want when you go up to that church. You know that's all they're going to do. Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? And sometimes our well gets dry and we go to pump and ain't nothing there. And we know it's going to take effort because now we're going to have to go get some anointing, pour it down the shaft, expand our life again, and then get busy. And we don't want all that effort. So we're going to wait till once or twice a year when a prophetic voice comes into town. We're going to bring our dry self into the house. And if God, if he, if God want me to work, then he's going to pour that anointing down my life. And he's going to make, no, no. Come to the altar. <laughs> Dragging on your knees if you have. Come to the altar. A seared conscience. It's dangerous. Notice how these people are characterized. These are people who depart, departed from the faith. Now watch this. Doctrines of demons does not come with a carton that says, bad for your spiritual health and will take you straight to hell. It's, it's not embossed with a warning label. When your conscience is dead, when it's seared, it doesn't feel anymore. The nerve endings are gone. You can't feel the Holy Spirit touch you because you're so seared. He says they departed from the faith. I believe that they were so seared because they wanted the gospel to mean this. They wanted the gospel to say that. They wanted to believe that God meant what he necessarily did not mean. And it, it wound up being a wish that turned into a want, that turned into their own devices, that turned into doctrines of demons. So Eve, just getting close to the tree. Ain't nothing happening. Ain't nothing happening. Well, I twisted that word a little bit. I, I, I changed the definition. I stretched its meaning a little bit. Nothing happened, so it must be God. Until finally the enemy steps up and says, well, you know, that's the truth and that's not. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening right now, even on reels, that's, that's trying to convince people that the Bible contradicts itself and it's, it's a lie, it's false, and you're an idiot if you believe it. And, and, and you go, well, do you watch that stuff? No. Why? Why would I want to try to indoctrinate myself with something I clearly know is not true? For the same reason I don't watch people that try to convince me that I'm, I'm a gender 546. Why? Because I know better. I don't need to understand your way of thinking to know it's not right because it doesn't line up with Scripture. It's why we have it. It's the ruler. That's what we measure everything. How many ever used a square? The tool, the square. Why? How many ever thought, oh, that's a square. That, that's really square. And you put the square up against it and find out it was just, it was just a couple degrees off. But it looked like it was square. That's what the gospel is going to do right now. It, it, it look, oh, that looks, that looks so right. That looks so right. But you take the square, the word of God, you put it up against it, you see it's two degrees off. Two degrees off doesn't look like much here. But you give it a few weeks, and it's bad off. <laughs> it's 
tip to be square. All you 80s children said, yeah! <laughs> Everybody else is like, what's he talking about? So even though they're saying most of the same words, their conscience is so seared, they don't know that while they're reading the Scripture, they've departed from the faith. Rabid animals have characteristics. Okay? Let me give you a couple of characteristics of rabid believers. They believe their own nonsense. They expect you to believe it. And many times their view of Scripture and the Gospel is birthed in some form or fashion from offense at God or his people or a defense for other people that are offended at the truth of God's word. So they feel like they're doing a service by twisting the scripture in order to make somebody else feel good. The point of the gospel is not to make you feel good. The point of the gospel is to make you know you're right. And I don't mean right as right versus wrong. I mean right as right before God. Okay. So to depart from the faith, there are people that have renounced the faith. They're listening to demonic spirits. And they've chosen to follow deceiving spirits and in so doing, they've deceived themselves. Can I tell you, the enemy is working so hard to confuse people that people that departed from God a long time ago are still praying in tongues, but it's no longer tongues from the Holy Spirit. It's tongues from a demonic spirit, and they don't know the difference. So because they can pray in tongues, they think they're okay. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. You're not. Don't tell me I'm not right with God. I pray in tongues all the time. There's a holy tongue, there's a demonic tongue. <laughs> Moving on. I believe the seared conscience is the worst case scenario for any human being because repentance is only possible as a response of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if you believe that you know better what the Holy Spirit says than what the Holy Spirit actually says, how in the world are you ever going to say yes to his convicting power in your life to say repent from that? That's why it takes the preaching of the gospel, not the ethanol. It's the preaching of the gospel. And when you find people that are inflamed, I can't believe you said, ah, why in the world have to say it like that? That's, that's not even God. That's not God's heart. He doesn't know. Watch. That's why you got to pay attention to this. You got to pay attention to your spirit because your feelings will get all warped. You got to pay attention to your spirit, not your emotions. Your, emo your emotions, your emotions are always following. They're either following your spirit or they're following your intellect. So emotions can lie. Did you know in, in the old days they had professional mourners? If they're having a funeral, they would pay them, I need you to be a mourner, I need you to be a mourner, I need you to be a mourner. And they would come and show up at the, at the funeral, <laughs> and they would cry the whole time. Why? Because they were paid to mourn. Were they broken up about the death of that person? No, they were celebrating that person was dead because they got some cha-ching in their pocket. They prostituted their emotions to get paid. And that's still happening in the church. Number five. And I wrap it up here. 
Can I brag on you for just a second? I don't know that I'm entirely right in the way that I view and see church and ministry from the pulpit. I don't know. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to take constructive criticism. I'm willing to tweak and do whatever I need to do, right? But I see so much that says less is more. Give them, give them less and they'll come back for more. And then I come here and you guys break the mold. Some of you, I can see you got little toothpicks. But most of you are like, what? No, whoa. Really? What now? Come on. Whoa. And you find yourself, it might feel like less time than what it is. But regardless of what time it is, whether short or long, you guys find yourself feasting and putting in demand and drawing. And I just want to say from my heart to yours, thank you for being hungry. Thank you for having an appetite. Thank you for caring. Thank you for wanting more. I don't want a commercialized experience. I want every time to be substantive and encounter, and I want every time for lives to be changed. And if others can do what I'm doing in 15 minutes, I bless them. I just don't know how yet. Number five is a weak conscience. It's not necessarily defiled, but it's not very well informed either. This is important to understand for a couple of reasons. If our conscience is weak, then we have to be very careful not to defile it. This sounds really stupid, but it's what comes to my mind. Sometimes when I'm bored and I'm upstairs with my lazy boy, I'll have this 25-foot measuring tape. And I'll pull it out and I'll see how long I can go before it, poof. I can tell I'm not the only one. Who else does that? Hold up. Look at y'all. Look at y'all. I know y'all's in the right house. So, man, if I can get to 10 foot, man, I'm like, woo! Woo! You know what I'm saying? Trying to see how far I can get that thing to go before it just, poof. <laughs> Let me see their hands again. How many was that? My goodness. Wow. But you know you can take that tape and just pull it and just pop it and, and you know, you can do all kinds of stuff because it's not that strong. But you want to see how far you can go. You've got to be very careful of the weak conscience. If we're not careful, we treat our conscience like that tape. I can go another inch. Watch this. I, I got another quarter inch in me. Watch this. Watch this. Watch. You've got to be careful with a weak conscience. If, if you know your conscience is weak, quit putting a big strain on it. Listen, if you're driving an old jalopy and you know them rods are tapping, every time you give a gap, you, you hear it. Don't go find you a 16-foot enclosed trailer full of 5,000 pounds worth of concrete and decide you're going to drag that for a little extra pay. You, you, your engine's weak, so don't put that demand on it. When your conscience is weak, don't, don't be in an environment and try to do something that a that only a strong conscience can do. I got to watch this Nicholas sometimes. He's strong as an ox. He really is. And he knows it. That's the problem. So I'll be moving some stuff and I'll pick some stuff up and I'm, I'm ginger with it, right? Because I have hurt my back in the past and I don't want to hurt it again. You guys know when you break that tape, it has these little, these little bitty spots on it. And now every time it, the tape gets it, right? 
So when, when you find that spot in your own life and other people are trying to blow past you in order to prove that they can do more than you can, what do you do? Hey, hey, quit it. Quit it. I, I know you can, and I'm glad that you can. I just want to see that you can a lot longer than I can, so quit it. Stop. That's what we got to do in the faith. I'm not trying to make you feel weak. I'm not trying to bring you down to, to my level. I want you to follow my example that if you take care of your back now, it'll be there for you when you're old. Amen. But if you just try to use your youth, well, I can do I can pick up 10 of these things. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. And maybe you can just one more time that you can't. You see what I'm saying? You, you got to be careful with that with your conscience. You can't keep abusing your conscience and expect it not to break. The second reason we got to be very careful about a weak conscience is if we're, re if we're relating to somebody that has a weak conscience, we have to be sensitive to their vulnerability. So let's, let's turn the tables. We're picking up 100-pound whatevers to put in the gym. And Nick knows that I'm going to struggle with that a lot more than he is. But instead of saying, hey, let's, let's do 50 or 75 pounds and we'll do it together, he piles on two and says, come on, man, you got two and you, let's go. We do that with people spiritually. They're not where we're at. They haven't been through all the stuff that we've been through that got us to where we're at. We say, come on, man. I can pick up two. At least you can pick up one. Come on, man. And they snap. So when you find somebody that's weaker than you, function at a comfortable level for them. Let me give you an example. We went on that motorcycle run, and the rule of thumb when you go on a, on a motorcycle group is the whole group rides at the level of the weakest rider. So if you've got 10 people that can blast 110 miles an hour down the interstate, but you've got one that struggles at 65, then the group rides at 60. You see what I'm saying? It's what we have to do spiritually. Quit trying to tell people how spiritual you are. I can do this. And bless God, I can do that. Ha, ha, ha. Function below what their capacity is so they can grow. Amen. Give them the opportunity to get where you're at. Not by lording it over them, but by functioning with them. Paul explains this in 1 Corinthians 8. When he was answering the questions about meat that had been offered to idols. Very familiar passage. But in case somebody who's watching this, this video does not know it, I want to read this portion. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that all that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or encourages. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything... He knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things that are offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom all things are of whom are all things, excuse me, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. What, let me put it in English. He's saying, we know there's no such thing as other gods, right? There's only one God. So if we get meat that was offered to an idol that was basically offered to air. What do I care? Bring on the barbecue. But for other people who are idol-minded and they believe that there are other gods, 
for them to eat meat that was sacrificed to an idol is a sin. So if I'm hanging out with somebody who thinks I can't eat that, I'm not going to say, get out of my way, punk. I'm going to eat that. It doesn't bother me at all. I ain't no idol. Because that defiles them because they have a weaker conscience. So if it hurts them to eat the meat, I won't eat it either. Do you see what I'm saying? So we, we, we ride to the level of the weakest rider, and we live to the level of the weakest believer. Because how in the world are they ever going to be elevated if they keep breaking because we keep dumping more on them what they can handle? Okay? Is that fair? I think I'm about to wear this notebook out. I don't have time to get through the rest of it. Let me just skip to the conclusion. One of my favorite passages in Hebrews 9, and I'm going to read this and I'm going to pray for you. But when Christ appeared, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 11, but when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, that is the true spiritual worship, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not a part of this material creation. He came in a physical form, in his body. He went once and for all into the holy place, the holy of holies of heaven, into the presence of God. And he didn't do it through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, having obtained and secured an eternal redemption, that salvation for all who personally believe in him as Savior. Verse 13. For if the sprinkling of ceremonial, ceremonially defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer is sufficient for the cleansing of the body, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the Holy Spirit willingly offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the ever-living God? If your conscience at this moment is not pure, based on Hebrews 9, it can be. We don't just do ceremonies anymore. Ceremonies only made us ceremonially clean. But the blood of Jesus makes us pure and holy and righteous before God. So he not only forgives our sin, he not only forgives the deeds, but he, he cleanses the conscience that's the memory for the deeds. I don't have any other illustration than this. Most of the time, unless the hard drive is just absolutely broke, there's nothing that was ever written on the hard drive that can't at some point be retrieved. If you have the right software that knows how to find it, it'll go find even stuff that you've deleted, put in the trash bin, removed from the trash bin, it's gone. But if you have the right software, you can go get that stuff because it's still imprinted on that drive. The government didn't like that. So they came out with some stuff. In fact, some of the most famous stuff is called bleach bit. Some of y'all don't watch the news. So it goes in and it writes over and back and erases and writes over and back and writes over and erases and writes back. You, re you remember the old, uh, uh, when I was a kid, before Etch-a-Sketches, had the little plastic pen and you write on it and then you peel it up? Huh? And so whenever you write something on there, even if you peeled it up, what's it called? No. It's from the 70s. You'll have to look it up. Y'all probably don't even know what it is. Anyway, so you peel it up, and so it's, it's no longer on, on the paper that you wrote, but if you look on the carbon beneath it, you can still see what was there. So if you wrote something that you don't want seen, now you got to and, and keep writing over it, right? So the impression is gone. God comes in and removes the impressions, not from the outside writing over it, from the from the underside, he just renews it to where it's fresh like it was never there. There was never an impression there. So your conscience has always got stuff written on it, and God comes from the underside and just whoosh, and fixes it, makes it new again. So if your conscience has either been weak, 
defiled, evil, whatever the case may be, you keep coming to God and you feel like you can't because your conscience reminds you of things that you did, places you went. I'm going to tell you one right now that's best with some of you. Some of you, Chris, I know this applies to you, but it's not directed at you because you weren't the one I was thinking about when I, when, I was, when I was saying this. Some of you know there are people in eternity because of you. And you can't allow yourself to receive the goodness of God because you're not sure in your own mind where you sent them. I need you to hear something about that. You didn't send them. They picked their destination. Just like you got to pick yours now. So some of us, maybe all of us, are going to have to not just submit our sins to the Lord, but we need to give the hard drive that is our conscious that reminds us of the sins. Even when the sins are gone, it says, I got a record. We need our conscience cleansed from the dead works so that we can come boldly before God. Does that make sense? Let me wrap up here for those that are online. If you caught this stream, I'm so grateful that you did. I pray that you heard something, grabbed something that ministered to you in a, in a deep way. If you're looking for a church home, we're looking to expand the family of God. We'd love to see you at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City, Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m., Thursday evenings at 6.45 p.m. Please be aware of Dennis Rainier, a prophetic voice out of Montana. is going to be with us the 24th, 5th, and 6th of this month uh, on uh, the 24th at 7 o'clock, 5 o'clock the next night, 2 o'clock the next, uh, next afternoon. I think we're going to have a minister section, uh, session, so not section, session, uh, probably on that Saturday morning. So I'll be getting those details out. So keep an eye on the calendar and on uh, social media. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.